human factors are the common constant, regardless of how your organization is structured, how the infrastructure is built, how it's engineered, what controls do you have? And it's funny because a lot of security operators, a lot of teams that are responsible for securing the organization don't even think about it as part of their overall strategy. Everyone is looking for just technical solutions to a human problem. What are some of the practical steps that small and medium-sized businesses can take to kind of reduce their exposure as it relates to these types of threats? You look at phishing campaigns, relatively low sophistication on the ones that have been identified, right? So they send a notice out saying, hey, there's been a sexual activity that's been identified within you. And then they have you go to a Google Drive folder that contains a zip file, which contains a renamed docx that's actually got an ex executable extension. And then from there, it has the custom loader that then decrypts the shell code, deploys it directly into memory via Cobalt Strike, and then ejects it via run DLL32 or DLL host for the DLL import. And so when you look at the techniques from a mature detection organization perspective, it's relatively easy to identify. And hopefully you're not allowing zip files with executables in them within your organization. But at the end of the day, the problem is, is that these techniques, most organizations don't have an extremely sophisticated detection program. And so you're running into this issue now where these types of attacks, even though the techniques that they're using aren't highly crazy they're still highly successful in most organizations. And it gives you kind of an idea of the current state of most folks that are out there today. We saw a while back that you could compromise software packages by getting people to pull down a software library from the wrong source. It was kind of inevitable that the bad guys would marry that with a standard typo squatting attack that we see all over the place in business email compromise situations. So just marrying the idea of, I'm going to put some bad code out in a place that looks a lot like where the good code is supposed to be, it's inevitable and it's going to continue. And it really requires people to pay attention to the details. And in this situation, even the fonts that you use when you're looking at a URL mm. start to matter. You can hide an L to a one in a font package. And all of a sudden these typo squatting things become very visible or very invisible. And we're going to have to continue to really pay attention to where do we get our code from and have we properly managed those S-bombs that we're starting to see really take off as a way of understanding our code libraries and our dependencies. If you've got a lot of fleshy humans behind keyboards at your company, well, your web browsers and your whole endpoint stack of office software and anything that's going to open anything via email or right. anything that's going to be at the pointy end of the web. So web browsers that might stumble over the malvertising campaign we were talking about. Yeah, browser patching is a big deal. And here we got it leading the news this week that malicious ads, yes, they're a thing and they've even <laughs> happened to Google. Think of the, the smaller ad aggregators and sellers who don't have a ginormous team to put together to screen those ads. If Google's struggling to get that right, just assume you're at the pointy end of very nasty code anywhere yeah. you go with a web browser or anything your email client can render to. It's been often said that what we call good security now and good hygiene now was just good system administration back in the day. <laughs> Getting to the ability to do good system administration is something that leaders need to put a high priority on to allow their person or their small IT team to be able to move quickly when there's a high velocity threat like a weaponized browser exploit or something that's out there. Because right. if on Monday you don't have something where I can push out a software update to all my machines with very minimal effort, if you need to patch intraday on a Wednesday because of a high velocity threat that's affecting everybody, Doing yeah. it manually is just and not going to work. I think these organizations, they should start focusing on maybe some more security measures. And Chris had said, don't click those links because that's where a lot of this stuff's coming in from. Maybe those mail gateways are something that you need to focus on. They're getting really, really, really good, especially with the spear phishing campaigns and I, you know, putting the content where to get people to click the link. You got to clean up your emails that are coming in to try to keep threats like that tamp down and keep them out of your out of your sight, right? When you look at the different methods that these groups use, there's usually a handful of key techniques that they're using. So you touched on credential compromise. Phishing is obviously one of the most common techniques. I think between phishing and credential compromise, those two together account for somewhere between you know 70 and 90% 
of all the different types of compromises that happen, right? So these are really, really significant stats that everybody should be sort of thinking about both how do I understand what that means and how do I protect against that? So what I would say is that there is a number of really straightforward things that an organization can do to help prevent those types of compromise. You know, I think everybody always talks about MFA. I think, you know, certainly that is a really good thing that people should employ and deploy if they have not, you know, making sure that you've done the analysis to say, what are my crown jewel assets and do I have them properly protected is a really critical thing to do. Mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, once you've done that first line of, of defense in terms of those types of protections, more traditional technical protections, right? I think, you know, starting to think a little bit about how is my human attack surface exposed? Because ultimately, these different types of attacks that are successful are actually leveraging that human dimension. They're tricking matter, they're coercing us, they're manipulating us to click on a link, to share our credentials, to harvest our credentials, right? And that's really how a lot of these things are, are actually happening. You know, I think that there is a move afoot today, maybe just to touch on one topic around passwordless and some of these more right. advanced technologies. And, I, and then look, I think technology is, is a good thing for companies to employ new technologies, right? To try to actually limit credential compromise and credential stuffing and these types of attacks. But it's not a silver bullet. What's going to happen and what we'll see happen is that attackers will just change their, their motives, right? They'll change or change their, their activities, I should say, right? They're going to figure out, okay, well, I can no longer maybe use a particular technique. Now I've got to steal your session token and use that to bypass the system, right? So again, these things that folks are deploying are really designed to make it more expensive and more difficult for threat actors to break in. It's not a silver bullet, right? And so I think it's just really important for folks to understand that, you know, folks talk a lot about defense in depth. I think that's really important, you know, and I would say that top layer of your humans is actually one of the most important places part of the discussion here. Just, just to maybe touch on some of the more technical stuff, I think, you know, MFA, password lists, right, traditional control sets, EDR, et cetera, right? Those are important things to do. But I think if you don't really dig into that human attack surface element, you're likely going to be in a reactive response mode more often than you'd like to be. Today, one thing that can be done by organizations, as an example, is essentially collecting and thinking like a like a threat actor, right? So a threat actor essentially is trying to look at Darren, they're trying to look at Matt, and they're trying to say, how am I going to use their identity to get into this organization to deploy ransomware, whatever it might be? They're not looking only at your or my work identity. They're also looking at our personal identities. They're looking at our social media accounts. They're looking at all these kinds of things, right? As a defender, one really simple and good thing to do is to not only take your work identities that you have for the organization, by the way, including your service accounts, mm -hmm. but also to collect the personal identities of your employees. You can ask them to opt into it as an example, if you don't have some tooling that can do this for you. And so that what you're able to do is essentially take the entire identity footprint of your organization and then collect passwords that are out there and exposed and then essentially block them inside of your infrastructure. So Active Directory, as an example, allows users to have a banned password list that's limited to 1,000 passwords, but you can actually take those passwords that are exposed for your organization. You can plop them in AD and you can prevent their reuse, right? So I think a lot of companies today are thinking about maybe my work identity and they're grabbing those exposed credentials, they're blocking them in AD, that's great, right? We would say that one of the key ways that organizations are being successfully compromised to deploy ransomware, et cetera, is actually through leveraging that personal identity, right? So expanding yeah. your, you know, really thinking like a threat actor, thinking like the attacker is an important thing to do when you're trying to prevent this type of problem from happening. You know, I think it's really important that people think about their organization really, again, from the point of view of the threat actor, right? Who is a high value target? So it could be someone who has the keys to the social media account for the company, right? Actually, quite a lot of organizational and reputational damage can be caused by hosting something that's inappropriate, right? On a company social media account or, or taking it over, et cetera. So there are many different types of humans that might fall into that group. And then just running a very simple campaign with them. It could just be an education campaign if you don't have the tooling to do this to say, hey, let's make sure that you're not exposing sensitive details about our organization in social media, right? Let's make sure that we're not posting specific personally identifiable information of like our birthdays or things like that that might be used for password reset processes in social media. So there's a variety of things that can be done, again, with some really basic tooling and some quick campaigns to folks that really focus in on that human attack service to try to make it more difficult and more expensive for the threat actor to come after you to begin with. Criminals have this tendency to play off their victim's sense of urgency. And so when we think about something like a banking failure, or even COVID-19 or election fraud, the Olympics, whatever it may be, right? It's a, there's this opportunistic element for how criminals think. 
And unfortunately, it tends to be like the smaller medium businesses that are the ones that are fall victim to this the most because they have the least amount of capabilities to actually defend against it. But like one way to think of it is like we really go into these like emotional factors, right? Like what are these criminals typically doing? First, there is a fear element. There is, again, the COVID you're going to lose your money or the, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it may be. Right. But there's also a time element. Do this now or by this date, this thing happens, right? So it's not only the fear, but then they're playing with your perception of time. I'm wanting you to respond fast. Like I remember as an actor, they, I don't know the mandate name for them, but they're, they're called Wizard Spider. That's another name they go by. They're users sure. the Ryuk and the Conti ransomware. And they had right. something called Bizarre Call. And li- literally what they would do is they would send emails to different users trying to get them to call back to Bizarre Call, like literally a phone call. And it would be something along the lines of like, hey, your Amazon Super Plus Premium account is gonna renew for $1,000 this Friday. <laughs> If you don't want to renew it, please call this number and we can help you out. And, you know, you're as a user, you're like, oh, no, I, I don't want that. What? I'm going to pay a thousand dollars. But yeah, it's, it's that emotional element. Right. And I think like particularly with phishing and those kind of things, you know, they, they kind of they get through our defenses. Right. They get directly to the user and it allows that actor to really play with emotion. So, yeah, that, that's always a tough one. Yeah. The human element is always so difficult to control in these scenarios, right? I mean, most small, medium-sized businesses have to move quickly, right? It's part of their DNA of of how they operate. And it's like, you're having to kind of temper that with some understanding of, hey, there's some new current event. All right. There's bound to be criminal elements trying to take advantage of that, send you notifications, and then you have to sift through what's real and what's fake. And that's always a challenge regardless. Um, yeah, I think a rule of thumb that I always like talk to, honestly, my coworkers about it, even my family, it's the notion of who's reaching out to who. If somebody right. is making contact with you, why? Whether they're coming up to you on the street or sending you an email or calling you, somebody making first contact with you should always be like, oh, what is this? Are you, is it really, you know what I mean? And so, yeah, I think a lot of it's just user awareness and kind of the human element to your point. Yeah. You know, the, the sad part about this is my in-laws, their job description is called victim. And they <laughs> they get these phone calls all the time. And it's gotten to the point where I actually look at their emails and I look at the who's calling them because they've spent probably twenty, thirty thousand dollars on just taking these dumb calls. And they give away, especially especially around Amazon. I think you're spot on with that one, Jason. And I think they've actually probably gotten that one. And so the elderly and the vulnerable people in society are the ones who make the payrolls on this. One of the other sad challenges is veterans are a big target right now. And so a lot of folks come home and they've served in the military. Or maybe their wife left them and they're lonely and they're trying to kind of get back on their feet. They're incredibly vulnerable. And typically we've seen just kind of the work that I do with transitioning veterans is almost an increase in the number of suicides or suicide attempts from guys that are being hoodwinked by, I love you so much, send me $60,000 and we'll make our dreams come true. Those are the other kind of, and you're right, Jason, they feed on the emotion. I don't know how to fix it, do one guy or gal at a time, but we've got to be better at educating people. We've got a particular type of tactic that is starting to ramp up over the holidays, similar to past holidays, honestly, where we've got cyber criminals that are typo squatting, common Black Friday sales, Cyber Monday sale websites, and are trying to entice unexpected shoppers effectively. This is not something that's new for this particular season, but what I found interesting about this is that a lot of security companies alert when users visit domains that were recently created in the past, let's say, three, five, seven days, right? Which is what a lot of these cyber criminals have done, where they've stood up infrastructure maybe a week or two before the actual date of their campaign or operation. But now we're seeing evidence of cyber criminals creating these typo squatted domains years in advance, maybe one to two to three years in advance. It's mainly a, a mechanism to avoid the domain age as being a factor in defending against this sort of attack. It's going to be getting harder for defenders to be able to deal with this problem, not only at the consumer level, but also at the corporate level. The one thing I would add to this is just as a general rule for consumers, it's very convenient to save your credit card in your browser, save your name, address all that, save all your secrets in a wallet. In general, that's not a good practice. A lot of times these types of people will unwittingly get tricked. And if you have all of that information in your browser, just out of convenience, you're going to expose yourself and it won't be a very Merry Christmas. Yeah, exactly. Using payment systems that provide like one-time use credit card numbers yeah. is highly recommended just because mm-hmm. of the rampant fraud and abuse that happens around this time frame. 
the attacker can customize an attack for your environment, given time and the ability to watch your employees and how you use the internet and so on. So attacks will become arbitrarily personalized to your world. That's one of the big concerns that we're tracking right now is the the effects AI have on phishing campaigns. Typically, we're a little bit more head on a swivel type. We're actually already pretty jaded and tend to look out for these things. But, you know, you poor Karen in HR, she'll click on a link if it says, Billy, who's down, you know, three cubicles down from you is he's sick. We're, we're putting a GoFundMe page together. Right. You know, click on the damn thing. And that's where the sophistication of phishing attacks are coming because, yeah, you're right. You can use AI to do behavior analytics. Right? There was a very cool attack this goes where you can persuade the new Bing to download an attack, disclose information about all the other tabs in the browser, and then learn about the environment by effectively fooling the user. Basically, a social engineering, you know, 2.0 yeah, at this point. Exactly. Wow. I mean, the Turing test is the Turing test, right? And so these things are extraordinarily good at social engineering. And yep. they can just sit and wait and find out the appropriate information, leak it out by a hidden channel. The key thing here is that it's arbitrarily cheap to customize the attack to your particular environment. It's astonishing because you can learn a lot about somebody by their open tabs. My wife has like 9,000 open tabs. So we, you know, it's a gulag of what I have tabs. But well, if you, but, yeah. if you go yeah. back to Bromium, the whole point was every tab was in a separate VM, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, for, for good reason. But you could still learn a lot about somebody if you can if you can get in and see their tabs. And uh, I don't. Oh, I think, sure you can. You know, you have a baseball tab open, and you have a news tab, and you know, you can probably figure out. You know, this person loves baseball and is a Republican. You know, social engineering campaigns are very adapted to that. And I think this is a scary one. Quick question though, I mean, because kind of down that same path, do you think AI's in terms of kind of where it's being used now to where it's going to be? Do you see AI right now kind of more in dealing on the social engineering side of it, you know, with human behavior versus the vulnerability side, which is kind of more the operational cybersecurity world? Or is is it kind of in tandem or is it moving? I think so. I think it's it's both. Vendors that know the intimate details of how attacks work will use that to protect you. That's cool. But the social engineering aspects are wild. I mean, they're nuts. Essentially, it's arbitrarily easy to make you look like Darian in this video, right? And sound like Darian or whatever else. And so... You could look like Biden and say, launch the bomb, right? So the problem is this whole social engineering aspect is really beyond normal human experience. We used to seeing people and listening to them and then trusting them. And we have a lot to learn. Yeah, I penned an article last month specifically about deep fakes, how they're being used yeah. in the Ukrainian conflict to go back and forth, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, I can't tell you how many times Zelensky has uh, has surrendered, <laughs> but this article was very focused on how criminal enterprises are using deep fakes to to affect law enforcement, to affect the investigation process, yeah. to affect politics. The intelligence community is starting to to adopt deep fakes for science. Sure they are. By the way, they're also doing it to protect their own. So they're using deep fakes or AI to protect the identities of their own people. They are. Conversely, a lot of some, you know, they're starting to use deep fakes to coerce confessions and yeah. conviction, which is another big challenge. And so I think there's, I think the bad guys are going to be ahead of us for a while. I think, well, humans have never dealt with this kind of threat before. Even if you look like, I don't know, I mean, you're a big guy, but we can make you look like Joe Rogan or something. <laughs> and sound like him too. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And uh, my wife would love that. But no, I, yeah, that's, you're right. And it's, it can be anything you want. And, and it's kind of terrifying, but really kind of cool, the, the opportunity that we have going forward. So I think there's another opportunity, which is to increase 
or use AI or use new techniques to detect the fakes and right. detect humans doing bad stuff or non-humans doing bad stuff. Yeah, I think the technology for deep fakes, you know, the meta tags are coming up for deep fakes. I think that's that technology is coming fast. I think AI is a little bit scarier because my colleague Ed Amoroso, he's a professor at NYU. Chat GPT has completely rocked his entire world. He's actually yeah. gone from doing written exams to to actually sitting down and having a cup of coffee with somebody and doing an oral exam. Right. These, these are freaking out. <laughs> or making people write in pencil or something yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, it seems like the common theme here is that AI is really challenging the norms of what we think of as authentic content, right? And it's becoming yes. indistinguishable to figure out, okay, what is authentic versus mm -hmm. what's been assisted? And how do you deal with that challenge across all these different mediums? Yeah. Yeah. I think we're at kind of the, the an inflection point where we don't know what's going to happen next. We're going to see some crazy, amazing use cases of, of AI. It's going to be extremely scary. And it's well, kind of the wild, wild west. One thing right? we, we know that as you know, security pros, we can reason about these attacks, but the average worker, they have no idea. Right. I mean, they'll just do the obvious and click on the link or whatever they have to do, but they will do the wrong thing. Yeah. So it's, it's a huge attack surface. Darian, I actually may be AI, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the developments with ChatGPT, you know, yeah. et cetera, right? All these different large, like, you know, uh, the LLMs that have been developed are incredible tools for the average human. They're also incredible tools for the threat actor, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, if you want to run an experiment for yourself, go to your someone from your senior leadership team, grab their bio and their LinkedIn profile, just that data, and drop it into one of, you know, choose your favorite LLM and ask it to write an invitation email for a speaking opportunity, just as an example, right? And see what the output is, right? Tell it, tell it you want it to be customized based on their experience, you know, use your imagination a little bit, right? But right. that is a very compelling lure and that's not hard to do. And so right. if you think about that capability, at scale where everyone in your organization can have their data harvested and then pushed through an LLM, it's pretty important to really think about your human attack service and how you minimize the right parts of that so that it can't actually be used to create successful phishing lures. So for anyone who is in our audience who has questions about either this topic or past topics that we've covered, please DM us at The Threat Show. Thanks again and join us again for next week's episode. Thank you for tuning into The Threat Show. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe to us on YouTube, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, and interact with us on Twitter at The Threat Show. Also, be sure to subscribe to Fletch's interactive newsletter and Trending Threats app to go deeper into the stories we discuss and the threat index. Be sure to stay tuned to stay ahead of threats. 